Welcome back to the playlist on biosignaling. Um, if you hear something in the background, that's my dryer. I apologize for that. Uh, just washing some clothes. Anyways, um, in the last video, what we did is we took a look at um, the mechanisms by which we increase we increase the cytosolic concentration of calcium ions, right? And we saw that the mechanisms by which this occurs is when we have an intracellular an intracellular rise in the concentration of inositol trisphosphate. And remember that this was inositol 145 trisphosphate, right, to be absolutely specific. But we just call it IP3. And IP3 bound to ionotropic receptors on the endoplasmic reticulum membrane, and that caused release of calcium ions into the cytosol from the ER, and we have a sharp rise in calcium ion concentration, okay? And another thing we mentioned about calcium is that it's a cofactor required for the catalysis of protein kinase C. Recall that protein kinase C um, was localized to the membrane where diisoglycerol was, right? And that calcium was required for the uh, catalysis of protein kinase C, okay? So that's one function of calcium, but in general what we're going to do in this video is look at calcium binding proteins, okay? So one of the calcium binding proteins that we're concerned with is a protein called calmodulin, okay? Calmodulin is a calcium binding protein. Specifically, if you look at the three-dimensional three structure, the tertiary structure, the part of it that's going to bind um, the calcium is something called the EF hand, okay? Um, EF basically just refers to helices E and F, okay? Um, and it doesn't technically look like a hand, but they call it a hand, well, just suffice to say for now, the EF hand binds the calcium ions, okay? Um, it sort of looks like a hand um, if you put your hand in a specific conformation, but um, just understand this is the part that binds calcium, so calcium calcium ions bind here and just like any time you have something bind to a protein it changes conformation right so if calmodulin changes conformation it can activate other proteins right so when calcium is bound to calmodulin it's in the activated state okay now cal calmodulin itself um, is one calcium binding protein and it is an integral part of another very important kinase called it's called calmodulin, calmodulin dependent, calmodulin dependent protein kinase, okay? And these are kinases, these are a class of enzymes. And they're usually just abbreviated CAM kinase, okay? So this is how we'll refer to it. Um, so calmodulin dependent protein kinases, what they are is they're, they're basically doing the same thing that protein kinase A does, okay? They're basically phosphorylating target proteins. One of the proteins that they phosphorylate is a very important protein that you should know. It's called phosphorylase B kinase, and we'll talk about this more later. Um, I can't remember if we did this in the um, adrenergic receptor video or not, but phosphorylase B kinase, what it's doing is it's phosphorylating an enzyme called, gly called glycogen phosphorylase. And so glycogen phosphorylase causes the conversion of glycogen into individual glucose 1-phosphate molecules that can eventually, through a series of conversions, enter glycolysis. Okay? So ultimately what you're doing is you're promoting sugar catabolism by, uh, by activating phosphorylase B kinase. So CAM kinase phosphorylates and activates this protein. Okay? And it should be noted that just like pro with protein kinase A, CAM kinase can phosphorylate a multitude of proteins. Um, some of them are getting these out of Leninger 6th edition. Some of these would include NAD kinase, which is involved in the biosynthesis of NADP+, um, nitric oxide synthase, um, the myosin light chain kinases, glutamate decarboxylase, which, by the way, is the enzyme that creates GABA. Um, let's see, what are some good ones? RNA helicase. Um, we have adenyl cyclase, we have cyclic AMP phosphodiesterase, both of which we saw in a previous video. Okay, there's just a like I said, there's a multitude of proteins that CAM kinase phosphorylates, and so they become activated. Okay, now um, that's the most important part of the video. Really, is right there. CAM kinase acts in a very similar manner to protein kinase A. The only difference really is that 
CAM kinase phosphorylates different proteins than protein kinase A. Okay, that's a big point. Uh, so CAM kinase phosphorylates different proteins. Okay, now when we have IP3 that's bound um, on the ER ionotropic receptor, we get a rise in calcium ion concentration. Now, one thing that's worth noting is that calcium ion concentration is not just um, it's not just just a sharp rise and then it stays constant. It actually oscillates. Okay, so I believe this is spelled correctly. So the calcium ion concentration oscillates. So in other words, it goes up and down within a certain range, right? Okay, and presumably this is because calcium ions have sort of a feedback regulation on um, the actual ER receptors um, that bind IP3. And so if, the, if because they're ionotropic, if you regulate those receptors, you're also too regulating the channel. So presumably there's some um, mechanism by which they come back and feedback regulate the calcium ion channels. Okay. Um, but the whole point of this is that um, is that calcium ion concentration is not constant. Now, remember that in the extracellular fluid, so if I have my cell, right, if I draw a generic cell, right, so here's my cell, and here is the inner membrane of the plasma membrane, right, and let's say I have my endoplasmic reticulum, here's my ER, right, Again, it doesn't look like that, but we'll just put it like that for now. Remember that calcium ion concentrations are high in the ECF. So out here is the extracellular fluid, and recall that it's high in the ER. Okay. Now, remember that whenever we uh, bind IP3 to the ER ionotropic receptor, calcium comes out into the cytosol. Right. Now, at rest, calcium ions don't like to be in the cytosol. They like to be either in the ECF or in the ER. So there are mechanisms by which we can pull calcium either back into the ER or pump it back out um, into the ECF. Okay. Now one of those things that does that is something called a calcium ion pump. And we're not going to go into the details here, but suffice it to say if I have a calcium ion, okay, if I have a calcium ion here, it can essentially be pumped out into the extracellular fluid. Okay. And don't quote me on this, but I believe it's also an ATPase, so it requires ATP to be able to pump the calcium ion. Don't quote me on that, but I believe that to be the case. Okay, So that's one mechanism we have. This is going to be your calcium, your calcium pump. In fact, I'm actually almost 100% positive it's an ATPase. Okay? That's one mechanism. Now that takes the calcium into the ECF. Okay? Now, there's another mechanism to get calcium, but it's going to go back into the ER. Okay? And that's through a protein called calsequestrin. Calsequestrin. It's called that because it's sequestering, sequestering calcium. That's where it gets its name. To sequester means it's going to pick up and bring back to a specific area. Specifically, this protein gets released. So if this is calsequestrin, it gets released into the cytosol. It goes and picks up calcium ions and comes back to the ER like this in a cycle. Okay, so effectively what happens is calcium has affinity for calcium ions, and then once it binds it in the cytosol, it takes it back into the ER. Okay, so that's your other mechanism to rid the cytosol of calcium ions. Now, this does not mean that the, the cytosol has no calcium ions, right? Um, at rest, there are going to be some. It's just minuscule with respect to the ECF and the ER. Okay, so that's an important point. Okay. But ultimately, at rest, we're going to try to keep the calcium ion concentration in the cytosol pretty low. Okay. Now, let's look at um, some important aspects of um, calcium in the cytosol. Okay. Calcium uh, activates two proteins, and let's look at them now. Calcium, do this one in green, activates. Oops. Hit a button there. Calcium activates adenylate. Adenylate cyclase, and we already know what that does, right? Adenylate cyclase is going to take ATP, right, and convert it to cyclic AMP, right? Now, it turns out that um, calcium also activates your phospho, phosphodiesterase, right? So it activates a cyclic AMP phosphodiesterase, and recall that that's the enzyme that takes cyclic AMP and converts it to just AMP, and specifically this would be 3 prime, 5 prime cyclic AMP, and this is just 5 prime AMP, okay? So 
ultimately activates both of these proteins. So why would it do that? Well, the whole reason it does this is that um, if you were to release, first of all, remember that cyclic AMP phosphodiesterase is a cytosolic enzyme. Adenylate cyclase is confined to the membrane. So if you were to release calcium into a specific area, you could potentially activate either one of these. So for instance, if you were to um, if you were to control the calcium ion release such that it went directly to the membrane, you could potentially uh, purely activate adenylate cyclase. Whereas if you just dump it into the cytosol, you're more likely to activate cyclic AMP phosphodiesterase, right? So effectively what you can do is you can create temporal and spatial changes in the calcium ion concentration that can basically uh, produce transient localized changes in your cyclic AMP concentration. So if you were to release it such that it activates more of the adenylate cyclase, you have more of the production of cyclic AMP, right? Whereas if you were more to activate the cyclic AMP phosphodiesterase, you destroy the cyclic AMP, right? I should have done that in red. So you destroy the cyclic AMP if you activate the phosphodiesterase, okay? And so depending on where you release the calcium, you can effectively control which one of these enzymes becomes activated, okay? And again, we're not gonna go into a whole lot of detail here about the protein kinase A. Um, I'm planning to make a whole video on the activation of protein kinase A. Remember that if calcium ions can control these two enzymes, they also control uh, activity of protein kinase A, right? So if you were to activate more of adenylate cyclase, let's say, so if you activate more of this, oops, you're going to have an increase in the concentration of cyclic AMP in the cytosol, right? So in the cytosol, right? And if you have that, recall that cyclic AMP is going to activate, right? And we'll go into a little bit, not much detail here, but remember we have a cap. A kinase anchoring protein. We have our regulatory subunits right here, right? And then we also have protein kinase A, so for PKA, right? And remember that each one of those regulatory subunits normally holds PKA in a vice grip. It prevents it from being activated, but remember that you can effectively bind. There are two binding sites on each regulatory subunit for cyclic AMP. Right. So assuming that we do this for both of them, right, um, the, the regulatory subunit will change conformation and PKA dissociates and becomes active. OK, so effectively by controlling calcium ion concentration, right, um, you can control the relative concentrations of cyclic AMP. Right. If, if you activate more of adenylate cyclase, then you increase cyclic AMP and you ultimately activate more of protein kinase A, right, through this mechanism, right, binding cyclic AMP to the regulatory subunit of, of this complex, right, or if you're activating more of the phosphodiesterase, you're destroying cyclic AMP, and therefore you would actually lower the activity of protein kinase A, okay? So let's do a very quick, very quick recap, okay? So we looked at one of the mechanisms by which calcium works as a second messenger, right, you can, it can bind to the EF hand of calmodulin, right? And calmodulin is an integral part of other proteins like calmodulin-dependent protein kinases. We usually abbreviate it CAM kinase, right? And CAM kinase can phosphorylate a series of proteins, and we went into some of them that are important. One of them is phosphorylase B kinase, and recall that that phosphorylates and activates glycogen phosphorylase. So ultimately, CAM kinase, when it becomes activated, it um, promotes sugar catabolism, right? And recall that from the previous video that calcium was also important as a cofactor for the catalysis of protein kinase C. Okay, and just remember that calcium ion concentration oscillates; it's not constant. Okay, and that presumably has to do with the fact that calcium ions can, when they're released into the cytosol from the ER, they can potentially feedback regulate the actual inotropic IP3 channels. Okay, and calcium ion concentration is not just—it's not just indefinitely stored in the cytosol. There are ways to remove it. One of the ways, of course, is the calcium pump, which is an ATPase. It pumps calcium from the cytosol back into the ECF where we have most of the calcium ions. Um, the other place we have calcium ions is in the endoplasmic reticulum, right? And that and the, the movement of calcium back in there is to catalyze, well it's not an enzyme, sorry. It's it's done 
by a protein called calcequestrin, okay? It's a calcium binding protein that effectively does this cycle right here. It goes out into the cytosol and effectively binds calcium ions and brings it back into the ER, okay? And depending on where you, where you release calcium into the cytosol, you can effectively activate either adenylate cyclase or cyclic P phosphodiesterase. Now, it's not a black or white thing, okay? You're going to have some of both of them activated, but at least you can potentially... Um, you can potentially control where most of the activity is. And if you have more cyclic AMP made, then you can effectively activate PKA more. But if you actually have um, more phosphodiesterase activity, then you lower PKA activity, right? So I hope this video gave you a little bit of um, knowledge about calcium in the cell. These are the main functions of calcium. If you understand these, you should be good for the purposes of biochemistry, okay, at an undergrad level. See you soon.